in praying about what to speak on when Pastor Justin asked me, it's taken me a couple of weeks praying it out to know what to, sh to share with you. But I heard a country western singer say on social media a few weeks ago when he was being interviewed by a very famous man, and I'm not going to tell you their names, and he's just written a very famous song that, that's come out. But he made this statement. The teaching about the rapture is not real. The rapture is not real. The teaching about the rapture came about in 1901, in the early, early 1900s, by Schofield, the Schofield Bible, and his name is Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. He lived from 1843 to 1921, and he said the teaching hit the church in 1901 about the rapture of the church, and there is no rapture of the church. We're all going through the tribulation. Well, when he said that, my antennas went up, my hackles went up, everything in me went on alert. And I said, I'm going to go and search in the Word again, to, and I wanted to preach it to you today about the rapture of the church. There is a rapture of the church, and we're going to be taken any day, any moment, any minute. So here we go. Today I want to show you the heart of a Heavenly Father. The heart of any good father is to protect their children from danger. So that's the heart of our Heavenly Father, is to protect us from any harm, from any danger that could come our way. If an earthly father wants to protect his children, how much more does our Heavenly Father want to protect us from any harm coming our way? So the Bible tells us that there's coming a day when millions of people will be evacuated from the world in a moment. It will be a time of chaos never before experienced in this earth. And those of us who are watching and looking at what's happening in the world today believe that that time for us is drawing near. We are right on the cusp of the rapture of the church. So the event that I am describing is what the Bible calls the rapture of the church. On the walls of ancient cities stood the watchmen. If the watchman saw coming danger, it was that watchman's duty to stand and shout and declare and proclaim that the enemy is on the warpath and they're coming to take you and destroy you. So we must stand for what is right. We must stand against what is not. We must shine as lights into the darkness and we must do all that we can manifesting God's word in truth and in love. So I'm here today as a watchman on the wall to announce to you that the enemy is out there and he's coming and he's coming to try to take over your place, your home, your fortress, your place of safety. He wants everything that you have. He wants to kill to steal and to destroy from you. But I'm here to announce to you that Jesus wants to give you life and give you life abundantly in every area of your life. So we must stand for what is right against what is not. We must shine as lights in this dark world. Ephesians 6.12 says, and I quote from the word, we do not war against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. My interest in the end times began when I was a little girl at the age of eight. Bible prophecy teachers would come to our church, and I was captivated by them telling us what would happen before the rapture of the church and what would happen during the seven-year tribulation period. And we won't have time to get into any of that today because what I want to share with you is lengthy anyway. But prophecy is important to God, and He desires for us to understand His plan. He does not want us to walk around in, in darkness and not understanding the signs of the times. So God is the one who controls the prophetic timetable. Daniel 2 verse 21 says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He controls the course of the world, the NLV says. 
He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. First Chronicles 12 verse 32 says, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel should do. So I want us to have understanding of the times that we're living in. I want us to be as wise as the sons of Issachar. We're not, we're not dumb. We're not ignorant. Amen. We are knowledgeable Come about on. our times and what's going on around us. Yeah. Isaiah 56, 10 says this. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Verse 11 says, yes, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from every quarter. Matthew 16, 3 says, Jesus rebu rebuked the people of his day for failing to recognize the signs of the times that heralded his first coming. Calling them a wicked and adulterous generation, they should have discerned the times for centuries before Daniel and other Hebrew prophets had predicted his coming. Listen to this. Simeon and Anna, mentioned in Luke chapter 2, found in their studies of the prophetic word that told them the time to go to the temple. They found Jesus the very day Jesus went to the temple. Amen. Those were two people. Oh, I've got goosebumps. Yeah. Two people who studied God's word that were not out of the know, but they were in the know of the seasons and of the times. So we, as studious people, are not going to be ignorant and stand outside. We're going to be knowledgeable and in the know of what's happening in our day. Isn't that exciting? That the Bible shows us, gives us two witnesses that they were in the know of when Jesus came to the temple. Glory to God. How much more reason do we have today to recognize the signs of His coming? We're surrounded by so many obvious signs that you would have to be blind not to see them. Over 50 years ago, the National uh, Science Journal had a cover which was featured a clock with hands set at five minutes to 12. The editor's way of dramatizing that civilization was rapidly approaching the midnight hour of self-destruction. And now that same magazine shows it one minute before 12 o'clock the midnight hour. Over the years, uh, that clock on the front cover, the hands have inched closer and closer and closer. So the scientists popularized the phrase end of history, the end of history. They meant the death of Earth through pollution, overpopulation, nuclear annihil annihilation, some other catastrophes beyond the power of world leaders and governments were so involved. Two signs predicted by the Hebrew prophet Daniel in Daniel 12, verse 4. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Then many shall run to and fro and search anxiously through the book, and knowledge of God's purposes as revealed by his prophets shall be increased and become great. Two signs predicted by Daniel for the end time should be obvious to all of us. The increase in travel and the increase in knowledge. There's never been travel like we have today. Never been travel. When the average speed of cars and trucks was 15 to 20 miles an hour until today, when rocket to satellite averaged 24,000 miles per hour, and we've had an explosion of knowledge. I mean, I could just push the side of my phone and ask Siri to give me the answer to my question. Yes. Knowledge yes. like that. And yes. one second, I can have everything answered yes. that I have a question for. Yeah. Has this prophecy in, the, in Daniel not fulfilled yes. in our very generation, our very Amen. life? Isn't this exciting? Yes. That was prof 
I think, excuse me, prophetic thousands of years ago. Daniel's time. Look at our day. We've watched that become fulfilled. Oh, goodness. So we need to be as smart as the sons of Issachar. Their times had perceived correctly what times and what they were all about. I want us to perceive correctly what our times are about. Today we know twice as much as we did two years ago. That's how quick knowledge is multiplying. Two years ago, we know twice as much today. Isaiah 42, verses 18 through 25. Hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servants, or deaf as my messengers that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servants, seeing many things, but they observe, not opening the ears, but he hears not? The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared and in holes, and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey, and none delivered for a spoil, and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Listen at this. They're all dumb dogs. They're blind. They won't open their mouth. They won't say what the Word of God says. Uh, my grandson, Preston, when I was telling him what I was going to speak on, said he was in a conference a few years in California. And uh, one of the speakers, when asked, when did he believe Jesus is coming back, his flippant, flippant reply was, I don't even know what I'm going to do tomorrow let alone when Jesus is going to come back. That was his reply when asked the question from the pulpit. The next speaker after him got up and speak, spoke about the return of Jesus. So there was one dumb, dumb dog lying there, silent, wouldn't even open his mouth. He, was, he did not know. And here was another one Amen. who was awake, barking, announcing for everyone that Jesus is coming soon. So that was a beautiful picture to me of what this scripture said. Yep, the Bible refers to them as dumb, dumb dogs that are asleep when they should be barking. Sound the alarm that the enemy is coming. I had a little stray dog show up at my house a few weeks ago. He's the most pitiful little thing you've ever seen. <laughs> And I instantly named him Scruffy because he was, he was pitiful looking. Had just knots, his hair was just knotted. And we had the appointment set up to have our dog Cash, which I inherited by the way too, from my other grandson. He paid $10 cash for him on the side of the road. So he's called Cash. So I've had Cash for 12, 13 years now. And now Scruffy showed up. And so I had an appointment set up for, for a cash to get groomed. Doggone, that's expensive to get a dog groomed when they come to your house. $125 to get. So Y'all need to go into the grooming business. I mean, somebody get your little truck and paint paws on the side. And, you know, somebody foolish like me would pay $125 to have you come bathe my dog. You know. But anyway, Scruffy. Cash's grooming appointment was that day, and uh, because Scruffy looked so bad, we traded him out and had Scruffy done. So this little dog, this side, this size, I paid $125 to be groomed. He's this big. Now, Cash is pretty big, so, you know, $125, I can pay that for him. But this morning, I'm not kidding you. I could hear Scruffy barking and barking and barking. And I see, he was sounding the alarm. I went outside to see what he was barking about. And he was trying to get Cash to play with him. Oh. Ca Cash is old. And Scruffy's a puppy. So they have this toy, this rope thing with knots on the end. So I stood out there and throwed it to them for a few minutes and let them play. Carmen, I did, honey. I played with the dogs this morning. I know. There is a God in heaven, and he, he does answer your prayers, and Jerry's prayers, and my children's prayers, and he 
answers <laughs> prayers. He really does. Yes, he does. I've never been a dog person or an animal <laughs> person, but I've become one. Aww. So here we go. Awesome. You know, but this precious dog was sounding the alarm, sounding the alarm to tell me something needed to be taken care of. So I did. I took care of it. I went out, played with him for a little while. But God, oh, he wants to take care of us. He's sounding the alarm. He's sounding the alarm. He's letting us see by everything that's going on around us that time is short. Now let's look at it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The word caught up. This is where they get the word rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible. But the definition caught up means seize, snatch, take, rescue, carry off, remove, spirit away. Don't you love all those definitions? Oh, I love them. Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus what would be the signs of his coming. Verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branches are yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Verse 33, so likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. Verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away until all things are fulfilled. This was literally fulfilled on May the 14th, 1948, when Israel became a nation. Isaiah 66, 8, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall a land be born in a day? Shall a nation come about? In a moment of time, yes, it did, and it was, and it is. God's timing is exact. He holds the future in the palm of his hand. The date and the time of the rapture were set before Genesis began. Nothing else needs to happen in Bible prophecy for Jesus to return and establish the earth's last kingdom. It's crucial for every Christian to understand Bible prophecy. It is the portrait of our future. God's promises to us, woven throughout prophecy, and his promises are good to a thousand generations. God's promises are in his prophecies. Think of that. His promises, there is the power to overcome in his promises. Our God is the promise keeper. Amen. Bible prophecy proves beyond doubt that God Almighty keeps his promises. Amen. His greatest promise other than the resurrection of Jesus was the rebirth of Israel, which happened, as I've already said, May the 14th, 1948. Jeremiah 29, 14 says, I will be found of you, Israel, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have scattered you and sent you. And you will bring, and I will bring you home again to your own land. God's promise in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 34. I will bring you from the nations. I will gather you from the nations and bring you from the countries where you have been scattered. The rebirth of Israel is the cornerstone of Bible prophecy. Israel is the cornerstone of God's integrity. If God had not brought Israel back, the major prophets of the Old Testament would not have been believable. Look at this. It makes what they say believable because that was fulfilled. They've been scattered across the whole world, but they've been gathered and brought back to the little bitty nation of Israel. That confirms to us. Oh, I've got goosebumps all the way up to my knees. That confirms to us the reality and how real that thousands of years they could prophesy over and over and over and it all be culminated into this one Bible fulfillment, yes. this yeah. one prophecy fulfillment. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. 
So the rebirth of Israel is the cornerstone of Bible prophecy. The nation was born in a day, Isaiah 66, 8. Who has heard such a thing? Who can see such a thing? Shall a nation be born in a day? In one day. David Ben-Gurion was bounding up the steps in Tel Aviv at the Art Museum at 4 p.m. The Jewish leaders and the international press were waiting for his arrival. At exactly 4 o'clock local time, David Ben-Gurion stepped to the microphone and announced the birth of the nation of Israel. And Pastor John Hagee said, 70 years later, exactly to the day, to the hour, and almost to the minute, under the direction of uh, Ambassador David Freeman of the U.S. Embassy, was dedicated in Jerusalem. <laughs> Glory to God. When Pastor John Hagee was privileged to pray the prayer of benediction over that event, he prayed this phrase over and over, Israel lives, Israel lives, Israel lives, and it went across all the broadcast channels. He said there was a divine anointing that came over the audience. That moment was a direct fulfillment of the promise of God. So let's compare the lives of Joseph and Jesus and see, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there. And I'm not going to teach on any of that. It's too lengthy. Too lengthy. One of the greatest needs that I see among believers is a desperate need for sharp discernment and understanding of the times. I'm amazed at how many believers don't understand what God is doing with the restoration of Israel and what is happening in our world at large in these closing hours of church history. Uh, every minister that I listen to, and I want to give you a list of some that I follow, Pastor John Hagee, Pastor Jimmy Evans, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, Pastor Bill Johnson, Pastor Rodney Howard Brown, Pastor Tiff Shuttlesworth, Dr. Robert Jeffries, Dr. David Jeremiah, every one of them, without exception, say, Jesus can come at any moment. There is nothing else that needs to be fulfilled because Israel becoming a nation was the major Bible prophecy fulfillment. Now, if we begin to open our eyes, oh, I don't need to just talk out because it's way back here. I don't want to get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. So I want us to take a look at some scripture about the raptures that have taken place and to point to you and show you, to educate you, which most of you already know about these raptures. But I want to quote this to you. In a recent study, only 2% of the churches in America are actually preaching what the Bible says about current everyday events. 2% of the churches in America. Because they're afraid, it's going to turn off their audience and they're going to lose their congregation. But in a recent book and study that's outlined this precarious moment by David Barton and James Garlow, he lays out that even though only 2% of churches are preaching about these things because they don't want to offend anybody, 70% of congregations across America want their church leaders to talk about what's relevant and talk about the issues of our day. So I am guessing that every one of you want me to talk about what's happening in our world and let you know that Jesus is coming soon. Whether it's abortion, whether it's human trafficking, whether it's religious persecution, whether it's cultural, restoration, sexual identity, these are all issues it's said that our congregation wants to hear about. So here we go. I want to talk about a little bit of it. Not much today, because I really want to talk about the raptures. To affirm in your spirit, man, what a loving God that we have that wants to take us out right when this world, it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse and worse and blacker and blacker and darker and darker because Jesus is coming soon. So here we go. The first rapture mentioned in the Bible was Enoch. There are various biblical accounts of individuals who were taken up in a rapture. 
And this has occurred in both the Old Testament and New Testament, demonstrating that God can take individuals up to himself whenever he chooses and whenever he decides. And when we study these other instances of rapture in the Bible, we get, gain insight into the rapture of the church. Events in the Old Testament are as foreshadows of the life of the Lord Jesus and what will happen in the future, according to Colossians 2, verse 17. The Old Testament stories happen literally. They point to future events, and many of these future events were fulfilled by Jesus Christ during his first coming, and others are still yet to come. The Bible records the following individuals who were taken up or raptured. Enoch, the Bible provides uh, details about Enoch. We see geneal genealogical records. The Bible mentions Enoch three times in the book of Genesis, and once by Paul, and once by Jude. So let's look at these passages. Genesis chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. Enoch lived 162 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begets, begat Methuselah 300 years. So all the years of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Hebrews 11, verses 5 through 6. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Amen. That he pleased God. And verse 6 says, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hallelujah. Now Enoch was the seventh son from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment. So rapture is a special event that bypasses death. A rapture is the rapid transportation of a person from this life to heaven without dying. It's a snatching away. It's a taking away. It's a lifting up. It's a removal. On all of the... Uh, ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These verses reveal that Enoch was a remarkable human being. He was said of him that he walked with God signifying that he was a righteous man who had a living relationship with God. In Genesis it is stated that Enoch was suddenly no more because God took him. Paul wrote it in Hebrews 11, 6, 11, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Enoch did not die. He was taken alive by God, serving as a foreshadowing of believers who will experience the rapture of the church for those too will not experience death. Glory to God. Because Enoch walked with God, he received revelations about God about God's judgment. And Jude wrote that Enoch prophesied about God's judgment upon the ungodly. And I just read that. Uh, all will be convicted of the ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they committed in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So the deeds of the ungodly will, will not go unpunished. They will be punished. In Genesis and Hebrews, the term was used, taken away. Genesis was written in Hebrew, and the Hebrew word for taken away, I can't pronounce it, but it's spelled K-I-L-A-Q-A-H, meaning to take, to receive, to carry away, to fetch, and to receive. Hebrew was written in Greek, and the word taken away is derived from the Greek word, meaning to transfer, to transport, are to change. We are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we're going to be taken away. Why was Enoch taken away? The answer is clear. Because he pleased God. Because he pleased God. 
This is not time to play religious games. This is not time to play church. This is not time to just think, well, I have to go to church on Sunday morning because it's my religious duty. No, this is the time to fall on your knees and consecrate your life and your heart and all the remaining days you have left to the Heavenly Father. Do you know how I'm able to do what I'm doing when I've lost the love of my life? It's from sitting on my bed with my back leaning and my head, leaning up against the headboard of my bed with my hands raised, consecrating my life to Him. All the days I have life, I live, I have left to live, I will live it consecrated to You, Lord, doing all that You've called me to do. So that's for each and every one of us, a consecration to Him. Nothing else in life matters. Gathering stuff up doesn't matter. Don't care about what you want. Just care about what Jesus wants you to do. What does Jesus want you to do? He wants us to win the lost. 4,555 souls in Sturgis. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. Enoch was taken by God. Enoch pleased God and walked with him. Enoch prophesied about the judgment of the ungodly. And Enoch is a type or foreshadowing of the rapture of the church. Glory to God. Now let's look at Elijah. Oh, my time's going too fast. The next example of some being, somebody being taken up in the Bible is the story of the prophet Elijah. And we find this story in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 2 Kings chapter 2. Elijah was a prophet of the people of Israel. And he prophesied during the reigns of King Ahab and Ahaziah. Elijah proclaimed the word of the Lord and brought about a three and a half year drought in Israel. He also is known for his foreshadowing, oh no, not foreshadowing, showdown with the prophet Baal and all of those 450. Elijah said, and I quote, this is pretty powerful. I am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the Lord who answers by fire, he is God. So the prophets of Baal couldn't make their god Baal answer by fire. However, the God of Elijah, he answered with fire, leading the people of Israel to honor God. Just think about that. I think if I remember the story, even told him to pour water. uh, Gallons and gallons, barrels and barrels of water. And I'm telling you, our God answered by fire. And the Bible says he not only ate up the bull, the fire destroyed the bull, but ate up the wood and licked up the water all around the trench that had been dug. That's our God. He's more than enough. He's more than enough to prove that he is a God that answers by fire. Hallelujah. So Elijah was not an ordinary man, and God used him to accomplish great things. And then we read in James 5, 17 through 18, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So there you see that God used Elijah to be a voice and a spokesman to to the nation of Israel. Later, Elijah had a disciple who would succeed him. He was no longer on earth. The disciple was Elijah, who spent a long time with Elijah. So let's examine his life. 2 Kings 2, verse 3. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, Do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. 2 Kings 2, 5. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elijah and said to him, Do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? And he said, I know. Keep silent. And it was so when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elijah, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elijah said, Please, Elisha said, 
please let a double portion of your spirit fall upon me. And with the signs of the prophets, Elijah and Elijah knew that Elijah would be taken away that day. And when God decides something, he always reveals it to his prophets. He just closes the mysteries to them. We're never left in the dark. We've, God's word has always been disclosed to us so that we're not fumbling around and staggering in the dark with a not knowing. He always lets us know. And so this was the case. Well, in Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Oh, he reveals his secrets to us. So this was the case with the sons of the prophets. The apostle Paul also received wisdom about the mystery of God and insights into the church's rapture and the transformation of the living. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. The significant difference between Elijah's taking away and the rapture of the church is that the prophets knew that Elijah was going to leave the earth that day. Well, no one knows when the church will leave the earth. But we do know the signs of the times, and those signs are all around us. The prophets prophesied to Elijah. And afterwards, Elijah and Elijah continued walking together. They were just talking and walking, and suddenly the taking happened. Woo, glory. Suddenly, I love that in quotes. Suddenly, the taking happened. We're going to just be about our daily affairs. And suddenly, the taking happened. Suddenly, the taking happened. Ooh, I love that. 2 Kings 2.11. And so it was, as they continued on to talk, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it and cried out, My father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. So he saw him no more. Elijah and Elijah knew that Elijah would be taken up. And Elijah was startled when a chariot of fire with horses of fire appeared and separated them. Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah returned to Jericho. And it is evident that Elijah was taken up to heaven and not relocated to another place on planet Earth. <laughs> the Hebrew word taken up is E-L-A-L-A -A -L -A, with little lines above the top. Taken up means to go up, to ascend, to climb, or to be taken away. This indicated that Elijah ascended to heaven. Additionally, the prophet chose the word, which also used in the account of Elijah, and in the book of Genesis, he was removed and taken up. Mm. Taken up. Yes. Noah. Let's look at Noah. So many people don't include Noah in the rapture. But the other day I was just looking at this and meditating on this. And I personally think the story of Noah is a beautiful picture of God's love, grace, and mercy in rescuing the human race. I just think it's the most beautiful picture. I also think the picture of Lot and his family being escorted and removed from Sodom and Gomorrah before judgment is a, is a beautiful story of God's love, grace, and mercy in rescuing the human race. So in Genesis 6, 11 through 12, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Verse 12, God saw how corrupt they had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. And I remember as a young girl reading in that very Schofield Bible that this particular man was against the rapture of the church. I, re I remember reading as a little girl in that Schofield Bible the commentary about the condition of planet Earth when Noah, the, uh, when God flooded the earth with Noah. And it, 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 it painted the most clear, depictive picture of how evil 
and perverse the world had become. And that's why God had to destroy it, because it said every human being, their mind had been infiltrated with such sin, it was just only total corruption. Mm. You all can do research and find that. I won't go into that anymore, but pretty colorful pictures mm. on what the earth looked like at that time, and, and we're there again. Yes. We are there again. Yeah. Uh, oh my goodness. I, I want, I'm not even gonna let my mind go down that and tell you some things. Maybe later I will. God decided that he had had enough. Noah walked with God in Genesis 6, 9. So God had Noah build an ark to save him and his family from the worldwide flood that would kill everyone. Genesis chapter 7, verse 16 tells us, the Lord shut him in and sealed the door. Shut him in and sealed the door. So if God has saved his people from worldwide disaster before, why wouldn't he do it again? Remember, he never changes. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our God is immutable, which means he's unchanging. This unchanging nature of God should give you a sense of security and reassurance. We may not know the day when the rapture will happen, but we can rest easy that we won't be here when the tribulation takes place on all those who have rejected God. One commentary that I read 30 or 40 years ago said that when God flooded the earth and all the windows and the depths of the earth broke open and all the fountains of the deep began to flood with water, Noah and his little family of eight souls were safely floating, gently floating, in the ark above it all. Wow. Oh, I love that. Uh, we, looked, we looked all week trying to find that commentary. It was, maybe Pastor Phil, you can do research. Trying to find that commentary that I read years ago that said Noah and his little family were gently floating above the destruction and the chaos. Amen. Do you not know that's what God's going to do with us? Amen. He removes us, yes. and we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're before the throne of God at the marriage supper of the Lamb when all the chaos is going on on planet Earth. Worldwide flood equals tribulation. Noah's ark equals the rapture. Wow. The ark represents safety. The ark represents separation. So God is going to separate us and deliver us right in the nick of time. To me, that's the most beautiful picture of God rescuing us in the future. So you can rest assured and have a heart filled with hope and confidence that God will never leave us nor abandon us in our time of need. Hallelujah. Now, I want us to look at another rapture. This is a beautiful one. This is Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, the disciples were looking intently up into the sky. This is the NIV. And he was, as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. The King James Version, chapter 14, verse 2, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to pre prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. Oh, that where I am, you may be there also. Yeah. Verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus promises that his death will not be the end. It brings specifically two blessings. It will enable him to prepare a place for them, and it will enable him to send the Holy Spirit to comfort them. John chapters 15 and 16, Jesus speaks of the disciples' victory over the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. And also in 1 John 2, uh, 1 John 5, 4, 
For whoever has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world right now. The price of groceries just keeps climbing and climbing. I stopped at a roadside produce stand out on 377 uh, about a month or so ago. And let me tell you what I bought. I bought one watermelon that was this size. I bought a cantaloupe, a watermelon, a cantaloupe, three tomatoes, three yellow squash, four little bags of purple peas. Do you know what my bill was? $96. Four bags of purple whole peas with a watermelon this size. A yellow meated watermelon. Anybody know what a yellow meated watermelon is? Oh, it's so good. I grew up on those. My daddy raised yellow meated watermelons. And he asked me if I wanted seeded or unseeded. How can you regrow another watermelon if you don't have seeds? That's what I want to know. Anyway, $96 was my bill for three yellow squash, three tomatoes, a little watermelon, a little cantaloupe, and four packages of peas. And I live by myself. (laughs) Dear me, what do families do? Well, I'm telling you, here's our confidence. For he who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We're going to have enough to take care of ourselves and take care of our families because we are people of faith. It doesn't matter what the groceries go to. doesn't matter what the electric bill climbs to. It does not matter what the cost of gasoline goes to. It does not matter how the economy changes. The only thing that matters is do you have faith in God? Can he supply your every need? But my God shall. Say that with me. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Not your riches. Not what you have in the bank. His riches in glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, there is a new translation that's coming out of the Bible, and it's called the RIV. Oh, I love this. So I'm going to read this to you the, out of the RIV. And the RIV translation is Renner's Interpretive Version. Rick Renner is coming out with his own Bible. This is Rick Renner's, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 16. We are anointed for the moment we're living in. You know what? God didn't have us born in 1866, 1868. He had me born in 1948, the year Israel became a nation. And guess what it says? This generation that sees this happen will not pass away until all things will be fulfilled. I'm it. He's coming in my lifetime. I'll soon be 76 years old next month, and he's coming in my lifetime. He's coming. Ooh, glory. Are you ready for this? Tighten your seatbelt. Tighten your seatbelt. This is good. I've never heard anything like this in my life. Renner's Interpretive Version. For we declare unto you by the word of the Lord, Those who are physically alive and who have survived everything, I'm talking about the remaining remnant that will still be left around at the time of the coming of the Lord, that living and surviving remnant will not precede those who have already died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a mighty military command that will arouse the saints and galvanize God's troops to action. And along with that command, precisely at that time, will also be heard the immense voice of an archangel, perceive those who have already died. The King James Version says that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, 
The word shout is from a military commander who gave a shout to muster all the troops and galvanize all the troops for battle. The shout was always a declaration that war was commencing. So that declaration is a seven-year period of tri tribulation period is starting. When that command goes forth, he's galvanizing us together. The shout also was the guarantee that at the end of the battle, he would be the supreme victor. It was a military command. In verse 16, along with the blast of God's war trumpet, signals that the final battle, the ultimate victory, and vanquishing of all God's en enemies is about to occur. That war trumpet blast will indicate that God's enemies have lost their long-standing battle with Him and that He reigns victorious and supreme over everyone, every situation, every realm, total victory. Woo! Woo! Glory. Woo! Glory. And when that war trumpet sound goes forth, the dead in Christ will immediately stand upright as they are resurrected to a brand new resurrected royal status. This resurrection will take place as a first priority before the next sequence of events takes place. Then in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, King James says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But the renter, the R-I-V says, um, in Greek, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. The word then implies and means upon that very moment, exactly at that moment, exactly then, precisely then, we meet with them. At that exact moment, we meet with them. In that precise moment when the dead are raised, the remaining ones, the surviving ones, those who are left, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up together. The Greek meaning is arpo or harponzo. Greek, Rick Renner says to catch, to seize, to take away, to snatch suddenly, to snatch just in time. When we are surrounded, he will remove us from danger just at the right moment. When we are surrounded, when there's no more time left, when it looks like we can't take it another second, we are taken out, Yay. caught out. When the, there are difficult times, when it feels like the world is filled with peril and there's trouble all around us, at that very moment in time, we are taken away. The Greek says, those that are still vibrant, the living ones, the spiritually vital ones, those that, those that are still spiritual, spiritually alive and remain, caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And Rick says the word meet, it's a fabulous word. It means to the meeting. We're going to the reception. We're going to the meeting. We're going to the encounter. And it's a technical word to describe a reception of the newly arrived officials, our royalty, our dignitaries. Which means when we are raptured, Jesus is going to receive us as the dignitaries that he knows that we are. That we are royalty, that we are dignitaries. And he's going to receive us and treat us as those dignitaries and as those, that royalty that we are. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the Bible also says, and this is a quote from Rick Renner, when we meet him in the air, even the word air is important. Air doesn't describe the cosmos. Rather, it describes the lower regions of the air. And this agrees with chapter 4, verse 15, which says, He shall descend from the heavens. He's going to come out of the heavens into the very lowest regions of the atmosphere. He's going to give that shout, and we're going to meet him in the air. 
Where is Jesus going to give us the VIP reception? Treat us like royalty. Throw a banquet in our honor. Because he's been waiting for us. He's been preparing for us. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Brother Jesse tells the story of going to heaven. Oh, my goodness. And, and one of the, the trip, Jesus said, take Jesse back by way of the mountains because I'll know he'll like that. And Jesse said there were condominiums, there were homes, there were houses, there were, you know, you could live wherever you wanted to live. And he said, the angel took me by way of the mountain so I could see it because he said he knew I would enjoy it. Oh, my goodness, just think. Hallelujah. My home's going to have running water everywhere. I'm going to have streams. I love running water. I love nature. I love streams. I love to wade in streams. I love all of that. Oh, my goodness. What's yours going to look like? I know what mine's going to look like, some of it. Of course, we can't picture it all. Because it's going to be greater than our imagination. But I do know I'm going to have running water everywhere. I'm going to have streams. Brother T.L. Osborne said to us, did I already tell you all this uh, some time ago? Brother T.L. Osborne told Brother Jerry and I, we were in Tulsa years ago, and he asked us to go home with he and Daisy Osborne to have lunch. So we went to their home, and Brother T.L. Osborne had the most exclusive Lincoln collection in the world. And he had a museum of all of his travels of all the hundred and something nations he'd been to. And those chiefs would give him swords and staffs. And he had the memorabilia of all his mission travels were amazing. But he had all these cars in this museum. And Brother T.L. Osborne said, sit down here, Brother Jerry. And so they sit on the running board of an antique Lincoln. And he said, Brother Osborne, how can you justify all of this? Being a minister, I mean, how can you, well, it was a museum open to the public, but how can you justify this? He said, Brother Jerry, he said, surround yourself with everything that brings tranquility. And from tranquility comes creativity. Oh, wow. From tranquility comes creativity. Yeah. So I put a water fountain when you drive up my driveway. If you drive by, you'll see my water fountain. I have water coming out of the pond. My swimming pool has fountains coming down. I have a stream in the back with running water. Running water, the sound of trickling water, just causes me to come alive. What causes you to come alive on the inside? Whatever it is, surround yourself with it. And because from that tranquility, will come creativity. Amen. Create. God wants us to create. We're made in his image and in his likeness. Good. Made in his image and in his likeness. Before they died, Muhammad said this, I don't know the purpose of life. Buddha said this, seek for the truth. Confucius said, I'm not the way. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the only one who rose from the dead. The other three are still in their graves. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want us to us to perish. The signs of the times. This morning I got up and I thought, well, I told you all about the rapture, but you need to know about the signs of the times. And I'm not going to go into depth about it. I'm going to give you just a minute of the signs of the times. Matthew 24, verses 1 through 44, and you all read it. But when Jesus came out of the temple, the disciples asked him, show us, tell us what the signs of the times are. And you'll read it, where it talks about famine, wars, pestilence, all of that. There's a whole list. And I want you to know that chapter is not just for the church. It's for the world. It's for the church. And it's for Israel. So there's three people. And you have to uh, di rightly divide it, which part's for you. When it says they'll run to the hills and hide, that's not for the church. That's for Israel. That's for the people in Israel. In, in the nation, those that didn't go up in the rapture, you're not going to be running and hiding in the hills. All right. 
You've already been taken out of here. But they are, they're going to run and hide in the hills for fear of what's going to come up on the earth. We don't have the fear of what's about to come up on the earth because we're not going to be here. Glory to God. Let me get back here. Verse 12 says, there's multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. In Chicago, the crime rate's gone up lawlessness to 1,200%. Detroit, 850%. San Francisco, Atlanta, New York, New Orleans, Houston. Open your eyes and look. You know, with all the illegal aliens that are coming in across our borders, yes. all those nations release all of the people in their prisons, in their jails, all their insane asylums. Our nation's being taken over by these people. Yeah. I mean, China alone has sent tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. It, our world's, our yes. nation's being taken right. over, right. just totally taken over. So open your eyes and see what's going on around us. Washington, D.C., there was a family just this last week lost custody of their autistic son who was 16 after re refusing to let him transition to become a girl. Tim, Wall, uh, Tim Waltz, the man who's now Kamala Harris's running mate to be vice president, governor of Minnesota, just signed a bill last re week redefining the term sexual orientation to include pedophilia just last week. These are the very things that was going on when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and when he destroyed the earth with the flood. So now we're seeing it. We're living, seeing pedophilia being made normal behavior. No, no. So we're here. The signs are here. Just open your eyes. Read the news. Look, look, at, look at some of the stuff that's going on around you. Don't be ignorant. Two biological males just this past week compete for the gold in women's sports. This is fact, not, not misinformation. The DNA tests showed that they both had XY chromosomes in girls' sports. Anyway, it's here. We're here. The rapture's here. So let me just read two or three more scriptures and I'll conclude. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and the dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them sadly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Now, I want you to circle, highlight, mark, put stars by this verse in your Bible. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. It's not going to surprise you like a thief in the night. You are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night nor of darkness. Verse 6, so then let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. Let us be awake and sober. Luke 21, 28 says, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draweth nigh. It draweth nigh. Verse 4 again, but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should come upon you or should surprise you like a thief. So my final scripture that I've already read and I want to read again, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So God causes prophetic utterances to be fused together with time so that they could not be separated from the segment of time to which they are assigned for complete fulfillment. Isn't that good? 
Shall I say that again? Yes. God causes prophetic utterances to be fused together with time so that they could not be separated from the segment of time to which they are assigned for complete fulfillment. Some of these events could not be totally understood until that generation had arrived on the scene to which this assignment was made, and that is us. Time is itself, in and of itself, is prophetic and has released that revelation to this generation. So we are here at this place and time where we need to be ready, to get ready, and to stay ready. Hallelujah. To be ready, to get ready, and to stay ready.